right. Um, uh, thanks, Phil, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank the organisers for the opportunity uh, to come and speak to you today. It's a real uh, privilege to be here. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the adductors and iliozoas, uh, following on from Anthony's presentation yesterday. Um, around, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so we've heard already that the differential diagnosis of groin pain um, is challenging and this may in part be due to the lack of consensus on the nomenclature and diagnostic criteria. Um, and we have heard as well that various structures and tissues are implicated uh, in the cause of groin pain in athletes. And so from this perspective, it seems that um, an accurate knowledge of the morphology of this region is essential um, both to help us in interpreting imaging um, and also with regards to the clinical diagnosis. I've um, put an image here from MRI and I'm just going to uh, leave it at that because I'm going to leave it to the rest of the presenters in the field um, who are far more knowledgeable than I in this area. I just wanted to share a little bit about groin pain in New Zealand. Um, we have uh, rugby union as our national game uh, and these are uh, photos from the Rugby World Cup in 2011. So the top picture is uh, Dan Carter who's a fly half, they play at number 10 maybe arguably, arguably the best number 10 in the world. There's not too many Aussies in the audience, right? <laughs> um, so he was struck down with groin pain in, in the pool play. Uh, this is his replacement underneath him. This is Colin Slade. Uh, he too had a groin strain. Uh, this was in, I think, about a week later in the quarterfinals. <laughs> so we're not doing too well. We're down to number three. Uh, we can't continue the groin pain story, but this is the third uh, fly half who came off with a knee injury. And finally, it was left to this man who apparently was out fishing the week before he got the call up um, for the All Blacks. And um, he was given the task of kicking the winning goal to, and we won by um, one point. So groin pain does um, reach all corners of the world. I just thought I'd start a little bit um, with the pubic symphysis uh, as I'm going to talk um, this re as relative to the adductors. Uh, we know that this is a cartilaginous joint uh, formed by the pubic bones in the fibrocartilaginous disc. Um, it's really important for stabilising the anterior aspect of the pelvis, um, obviously important for shock absorption as well. We know that uh, we do see degenerative changes at this joint that are usually age related uh, and they may or may not be symptomatic. And um, I'm sure Sonia will touch on this more, but there's a suggestion that um, degenerative changes may be more common um, in athletes who have long standing symphysial pain. This is uh, on the top picture a cross section through the, the disc region at the, at the pubis and so you can see kind of the extent of, um, of its morphology. Uh, it's been described as similar in structure to the intervertebral disc um, but there's not a lot of... Is it not working? Okay, is that better? We can just try it again if it's better in the back. Is that alright? Is it better in the back? Yep, yep. okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, and so just a, a little test, does anyone know how wide the um, sorry, interpubic disc is? Should I take this one off? Okay, can I just talk like that? Can you still hear me? Okay. <laughs> um, so the width of the disc, any takers on how wide that is? <laughs> is anyone awake? No, um, it's about four millimetres, so it's, uh, it's fairly small. Um, and we know that we can expect to see a, a primary cleft in the disc, which is um, physiological and it's a small amount of fluid. Again, finding a picture to show you was a little bit difficult. Um, the one at the bottom, the grey area uh, through here, is um, supposed to represent the cleft, um, but it's usually confined to the superior posterior upper half of the disc, and so this isn't really a very um, good representation of it, but it gives you an idea of where you might see it. If we think about the support around the joint, we can think of uh, static ligamentous structures. Uh, and so this is a preparation, an anatomical preparation, and it's, you can see obviously through the pubic joint, you can see the anterior pubic ligament across the front, posteriorly the posterior pubic ligament, and you can see the connective tissue lying in front of the joint, um, which is what we're going to go on and talk about. And if we look at, this is a picture from the um, a posterior aspect, you can uh, see the superior pubic ligament, which is quite narrow but reasonably broad, and the inferior or the arcuate pubic ligament, which is really important for stabilising um, the inferior aspect of the joint. 
So if we think about the stabilising structures in terms of um, dynamic uh, structures, we know that when we're thinking about adductor-related groin pain, um, this predominantly affects adductor longus. Um, and when you go and look at the literature around the data on the frequency of injury to adductor longus at different anatomical uh, places, it's, there's actually very little on it, so we don't really know the frequency of injuries at sites such as the emphasis, the tendon, musculotendous junction and muscle. So it hasn't really, really been systematically um, investigated. And I guess even more surprising is that there are very few studies on the proximal anatomy of this region, um, particularly given um, its involvement um, in groin pain. The picture to the right is um, pretty old, but you could probably, like Anthony said yesterday, you can probably take any textbook and um, this is what you might see. So we've got some nice kind of homogenous looking muscles here. They don't appear to have any tendons. Um, and so it would be nice to try and update our um, information as to what's getting out um, in the literature as to how these muscles actually um, are from a morphological perspective. Briefly, uh, looking at their proximal attachments, so at the anterior pubis, adductor longus just before the pubic, below the pubic tub tubercle, and further down, adductor brevis and gracilis. And we know that all of these tendons have fibrocartilaginous emphases, um, which is probably functionally um, resists them from compressive stresses and also um, restricts excessive shear on the pubic bone um, at their insertion. And um, as with regard to adductor longus, it does have distinct proximal morphology. Um, we know that the uh, superficial surface is tenderness and we have deep fibres sorry, um, um, underneath it. And it's pretty clear that it does insert into the pubic bone and in most places, cases it also fuses with the capsular tissues at the anterior surface of the joint, um, although there may be some variation in that it's just um, especially uh, or restricted to the pubic bone insertion. You'll see there that adductor brevis also in some cases, so just under half, um, also blends with those capsular tissues and hopefully you can see from the picture the tendon of gracilis which is tracking across uh, the front of the joint uh, through here. So you can see bridging across this side and coming up through there as well. Um, Anthony showed this sh slide yesterday, um, just as a quick revision. Uh, we know that adductor longus also blends with contralateral uh, distal rectus sheath, uh, the contralateral adductor longus, uh, so almost in the same line or plane as the arcuate ligament. In some cases, the ilioinguinal ligament on the same side. Uh, and you can see there as well, and I guess when you're looking at imaging, you may or may not expect to see fusion with gracilis. So not so common for adductor longus, but more so um, in all cases, adductor brevis and gracilis fuse in the region of the symphysis. Um, I'm just going to skip over that slide because we spoke about um, that yesterday. And I wanted to show you some um, histological sections uh, through the tendons. Uh, and this is something I guess you might see on imaging. Uh, this stain here, the tendon is red, uh, so you can see that down here, and the muscle tissue is brown. And so when you look at the muscle from the surface, you see the nice superficial tendon, but actually if you cut through it, you can see the tendon in its intramuscular course. Uh, so you can see really close up to the emphasis a pretty... Um, a lot of tendon tissue, as you go further down, you can see it's getting thinner um, and less prominent, but you can definitely see it tracking uh, through the muscles. Um, and we measured the length of these tendons, and so just from a um, percentage of femur length, you can see that the intramuscular tendon of adductor longus extends almost 25% of the length of the femur. So it's just something to think about when you're looking perhaps at musculotendinous junction injuries. Um, the tendon of adductor brevis is much smaller, as you'd expect, um, and these tend to extend further than the superficial tendon. Uh, functionally, the relevance of the intramuscular tendons, um, perhaps they enhance the stability and strength um, of the region during muscle contraction, um, but we don't know a lot about that um, from a bio biomechanical perspective. And um, we also decided to look at the vascularity of the tendons, um, and this study is done on cadavers. Uh, and so we express the cross-sectional area of the blood vessels relative to the cross-sectional area of the tendon. Uh, and what you can see here, uh, that, so adductor longus is um, blue, brevis is red, and gracilis is yellow. Um, and so what we found was that um, adductor longus, as you can see, was the least vascular tendon of all of those. 
Um, and as you get towards the enthesis, they become less vascular, which you would probably um, expect. Um, gracilis was a little bit um, different to that. Um, but this is kind of interesting, and, and perhaps it has some influence on um, the rate of um, tendon injury or has some role in, um, in the repair. So it would be nice to try and take this further and look at it, perhaps, in, in living individuals. Just wanted to pass over now and talk a little bit about ileozoas. Um, so we could think about ileozoas in terms of uh, tendinopathy or in, in snapping hip. Uh, again, uh, when we're thinking about snapping hip, we're looking at the tendon of ileozoas in relation to deeper structures, so the iliopectineal eminence or the femoral head where it's thought to snap over um, those structures. And there's also been a suggestion in the literature about an association with the labrum um, in the region of the musculotendinous junction and, and the role that has in femoroesotibular impingement. And so I think, again, the anatomy of ileozoas is important when we're thinking about um, imaging and also um, management and the pathogenesis of um, ileozoas problems. Uh, just a brief outline of anatomy. Uh, so in this picture you can see quite nicely, hopefully through here, um, zoas major, so quite a long fusiform uh, muscle. You can see lying um, anterior to it, zoas minor, and in some sources people clump this together with zoas major, but um, it's absent in about 40% of cases. And it's quite distinct because you can see it's got a really long distal tendon, uh, and this inserts down onto the pubis. So it's probably um, wise not to clump it together because they have different uh, distal insertion sites. Um, further down here on the iliac, you can see um, iliacus. And so these are obviously important hip flexors. Um, I think sometimes when we think about zoas, perhaps we um, don't think a lot about its, its function on the, or action on the lumbar spine. Um, it inserts into the transverse processes and the sides of the bodies and discs. And so because of the orientation of the fascicles, some are anterior to the centre of the axis of rotation and they kind of fan backwards. Um, and so based on the work that Bob Duck did a long um, time ago now, um, it seems like they have a compressive force on the lumbar spine. Um, and so that could be important to think about when you're assessing a patient as well. Just a quick uh, reminder where the uh, muscles lie in relation in the femoral triangle. Uh, so you can see the um, femoral vein, artery and nerve, um, iliozoas over here, pectineus and adductor longus. Um, so those vessels are useful obviously when we're trying to identify um, these structures on imaging. And on the right hand side, zoas has been removed and so you can see the passage of the lumbosacral plexus uh, where it would be passing through the body of zoas if it was there. Um, but quite nicely you can see the flat kind of triangular shape of iliacus um, as well. And obviously the, um, the muscular tendons unit passes underneath or deep to the, ileo, in, sorry, the inguinal ligament. So how does the zoas, iliozoas tendon form? Um, and I thought this might be relatively straightforward, but again, uh, in the literature there's a lot of different um, nomenclature used to describe um, this tendon. I think it's probably safe to say that it, it usually is composed of at least two distinct tendons. Um, and it seems fairly uh, certain that the main tendon is formed from zoas. Um, and so you can see here uh, the tendinous tissue through here. Um, and so that originates or starts about the level of the inguinal ligament. Um, this tendon is obviously the most medial and it's the largest. And then, uh, depending on what you'd like to call it, uh, there's a second tendon um, that arises from ilia iliacus, and it's from the medial fibres of iliacus. So they two form a tendon that then may blend with the main tendon as it heads down to its insertion. Um, and hopefully you can see on this picture there's quite a lot of other muscular fibres here that are wrapping around the front um, of the femur. And so when we think about those insertions, uh, this is a schematic, it's, it's fairly rudimentary, but it, I think it um, shows what we're trying to explain is that um, you can see zoas forming the main tendon, the medial fibres of iliacus coming through as well, and then in the purple you've got the lateral fibres of iliacus which um, come down and they have a muscular insertion more anterior on the trochanter and, um, and, and there may be an intramuscular tendon there as well. And then somewhat um, variable is the presence of a fourth bundle which is deep to those lateral fibres um, and that's sometimes called the ileo infratrochanteric bundle um, which inserts down in the infratrochanteric region. 
And then uh, just to, um, this was really nice timing um, <laughs> for this presentation, um, a recent study, and this was conducted on 53 um, cadaver hips. And I think um, it shows really nicely is that we would, and most people expect to see the double tendon, so the primary zoas tendon and another um, iliacus. You may, in 30% of cases, see a single zoas tendon, and this is down, sorry, at the level of the greater trachanta. And then in a small percentage of people, you get those three tendons. So you've got the main zoas, the main iliacus, and then you've got an accessory iliacus tendon coming in as well. Um, and so perhaps that um, is useful to bear in mind if you're looking at imaging um, and or um, such modalities as that. So moving. <laughs> I just wanted to finish off very briefly um, about the bursa. Uh, and the top picture there shows you what a bursa looks like on dissection. Uh, so I usually describe it as a, um, like two pieces of cling film together. It's obviously a potential space. Um, you can see it there where the forceps are pointing. Um, usually there's a layer of fat um, there that's from the hip, um, or in the lateral hip. But looking at the bursa um, was challenging because most sources seem to refer to um, paper by Chandler in 1934, and he looked at 400 hips. Um, it seems that this is constant, so it's there at birth. Um, and it's obviously produced by the friction of the iliozoas tendon as it passes underneath it. Uh, it's described as the largest bursa in the body, although I thought that honour was um, reserved for the subacromial bursa, but it's obviously of similar dimensions. And I think this is where the, um, the value of communicating with the capsule in about 15% of cases, um, and talking uh, to people at, um, on imaging perhaps, um, we see this a little bit more often, um, but uh, it was really difficult to find any more data um, on that communication, which was um, a bit unfortunate. Uh, and there is a little bit of um, data suggesting that perhaps that burst is divided into compartments to align with the tendons that are passing under it. Um, but again, uh, sorry, the picture's not great, but it's about <laughs> um, as good as I could find to show you where that um, bursa sits. Um, and obviously you can see it quite nicely here if it's um, filled with fluid. Uh, so I think there's quite a lot um, that could be done to update our knowledge of um, the early zoas, particularly distally and particularly um, on the bursa as well. Um, so I'll just finish um, there. I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs>